Welcome to the Jaco Report. I'm Charles Jaco. Violent crime in St. Louis has become a statewide issue, with Governor Mike Parson meeting twice in St. Louis recently on the issue, and the Missouri legislature possibly forming committees to look at the problem. Meanwhile, the outrage continues over the rash of killings of children aged 16 and under. Only one arrest has been made in those murders. As the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department deals with crime overall, it's still over 100 officers short. Mayor Lyda Crewson told us on this program the officer shortage isn't because of money, it's just because not enough people apparently want to be St. Louis cops. And then there are the continuing problems of city officers investigated for racist or violent Facebook posts, a growing list of officers not being allowed to bring cases to the circuit attorney because of allegations of past misconduct, and a city police union often perceived by many people as racist. Joining us today is Chief John Hayden of the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. He is the man in charge of all of this. Chief, good to see you again. Thank you very much for coming in. Good to see you, Charles. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, but Governor Parson, there, he's been in town twice, most recently the widely publicized crime summit at City Hall featuring you, the governor, the mayor, a um, uh, number of people. What came out of that in your mind? Is it more logistical help? Was anything pledged? Uh, more officers? I mean, specifically, what came out of that summit that you can use as a cop to try to do something about Sure, this. so what so what came out of it for me, Charles, was my ability to share some of our challenges. And so, as you know, we like to, we've, we've got an uptick in violence this summer. Um, there, there, are, there are ways in which other organizations, such as uh, the Missouri Highway Patrol, could be, potentially be helpful. I know that they helped us a lot last year. Um, we, we talked about the fact that um, uh, there was an assessment of our special, uh, our task forces, our federal task forces that we are involved in. And so really, uh, the, what, what I brought to the table is, is kind of what we're doing now, and, and people were kind of chiming in on what they might be able to do to assist with some of the um, challenges that we face. Might be able to do. Any specific promises come out of that at all? No, I think, so the, the first meeting was about assessment, and I think the next meeting will be about uh, promises, about commitments to uh, various resources. When's the next one coming up? I think in about 10 days or so. In about 10 days. Yes, sir. Now, there, there was quite a flap caused because none of the prosecutors, the city prosecutor or the county prosecutor, uh, were invited to this. Neither was the state attorney general. Um, a lot was made that these are both reform-minded prosecutors who butted heads with law enforcement before. How do you read that or is that above your pay grade? Well, I, 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 I didn't, I, I certainly was more interested in boots on the ground. I mean, you know, hey, I'm 126 officers short. We, we're doing a lot of overtime. Um, we, like I said, we are working very closely with a lot of federal task forces. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, hey, my, what I was trying to get out of it is, is kind of what you mentioned earlier. Hey, uh, I was given an assessment of what, I, what, I, what I'm working with, some of my challenges, and uh, people were chiming in about um, how they might be able to, and I think there's going to be some commitment um, in coming days. Yeah, you know, I was just wondering though, as far as the prosecutors go, uh, obviously boots on the ground is important, but the prosecutors have to do the follow-up, and one just wonders why they weren't there. Well, hey, that's a, that's a, a something. That, in other words, that's kind of not what I bring to the table. I bring to the table the enforcement piece, and so um, uh, if if they weren't there, uh, maybe I don't know if there was certainly the, the the emphasis of the meeting was enforcement. But that being said, hey, um, I was an invited guest myself, so. What's the status of the case, and, and you'll forgive me, but there have been so many of them I've lost count. The number of, of kids 16 and under who've been shot and killed since April. Uh, I know there's been one arrest, uh, the white guy who shot the black kid on the south side. There's been one guy in custody, the one who's being held by the feds on the armored car That's charge, correct. but no charges have been filed. But nothing else has happened in any of the other cases why is that? Are people just not coming forward? Are there too many cases for your department to handle at once? What's up? No, so uh, our, bi our biggest challenge in, any, in all of our homicide investigations uh, is trying to get witness participation. And so, hey, uh, a prime example, I, I, I thought surely uh, we'd be much farther along on the, uh, the, the, the little girl journey, little journey. There was a lot of people out that night. I mean, so, and so that was, um, uh, you know, and there's, and there's tips coming in but the tips that we need to make an arrest, we have we don't have it yet. But the point being is that surely um, there, there's there there's there are potentially a lot of people that witnessed that that would know why uh, uh, certain people would have been targets up there. She was not a target, of course, but there were there were teens in and around her, and and certainly 
um, the disappointment that I that I that I have, and I, I'm sure many in the community has, is the fact that um, you know p people know what's going on, and and they're not forthcoming with the police. Little Journey was one of, I believe, let's say, eight or ten kids under 16 have been shot and killed. Has there been a similar lack of people coming forward in every one of those cases? Yeah, so that's... This so, is a pattern all so, over so, the place? Right, the, pa the pattern is consistent with, with, with homicides in general. So what, so what I would tell you is that the biggest challenge to solving homicide investigations is, is the fact that we don't get a lot of witness participation. I was surprised, uh, certainly, certainly the, when, uh, when the uh, rewards were announced, about the, about the kids ten and under, I, that was there was a you know there was an influx of of tips, but they have they have not um, continued with the same level of enthusiasm. If people aren't coming forward, I mean, you reach one of two conclusions: either number one, uh, people in these communities don't care that children are being shot and killed, or number two, they're terrified of something that's keeping them from from coming forward. What's up? I know that I've read a, read a couple of articles and certainly certainly I certainly when I'm on scenes I hear things like this but hey there's a there's certainly a reluctance to get involved. I think people are more worried about what will happen to them if 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 they assist with the police versus what will happen so to So they're afraid of the gunman who killed the kids or some of their associates maybe coming after them. I think that they're I think that that's that's part of the concern. Uh, it, but it does, but it, but it, but not in all cases. So in Hyde Park, when when little Xavier was shot, uh, the community said that they, they, there was a lot of input on on that investigation. So uh, I, I just wish it was that case uh, that that was consistent, that we consistently would get information. But it, but it's it's very disturbing when you have the the, the little kids ten and under uh, 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 being victims, knowing that they weren't they, they they weren't they don't fit any patterns that we would say. If I tell you that fifty percent of my homicides. Are drug related. If I say 35 percent of personal disputes, those little innocent ten, year, 10 and under weren't involved in anything, but they lost their lives. All right. If you've got a community that's largely not coming forward, whether for fear or any other reason, you've got a proliferation of guns on the street. Um, what does a task force or realigning things? What difference? is that possibly going to make? Let's say you get the Missouri Highway Patrol and they'll patrol the interstates for you. Sure. Yeah, that, that'll free up some officers, sure. right? You authorize a lot of overtime. You flood the zone. Uh, but you're still gonna have the same number of guns on the street. You're still gonna have communities living in fear. Mm -hmm. And you're still gonna have the underlying causes of poverty, joblessness, right. hopelessness that led to this in the first place. I guess my question is, knowing all that, what good does a task force like that actually do to stop these killings when all the underlying stuff is still there? Well, you said that certainly, so, so one, I would disagree with you on all the number of guns will be on the street. I mean, I think that certainly uh, the, the, as often as we can get guns out of the hands of, of known felons, for example. Hey, we, we've seized over 1,700 guns in, uh, so far this year. 1,700? 1,700, that's and correct. And this was guns... These are, well, from felons, from, from, in some in some instances from felons, and some some unclaimed, or some uh, so, sometimes there's a cache of guns that we that we that we stumble upon because neighbors say, hey, these, this certain group of group of kids keep hanging around here. We know that we know we hear gunshots at night, and we may find uh, uh, se several several firearms at you know in a, in a discreet place. But the point is, is certainly the, the the work that we're doing to 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 address violent crime, I think, is certainly buttressed by. Uh, participation on task forces. It's, it's very helpful. You know, like I say, you can't, you, obviously with the challenges, it, it, you, we can't do enough of it, but at the same time, the enforcement piece is very, very much a part of, of getting control of some of the violent crime. So how's that enforcement piece going to look? If you get this highway patrol in, and maybe you get a few additional federal resources, you know, a few extra marshals or something, um, these killings have been happening all, all over the place. I mean, in a few neighborhoods, but not in the same two or three block area. How, what's it look like tactically from an enforcement point of view to try to deal with that? What, what would your plan right. be? You've, you've been flooding the zone in the so-called Hayden's Rectangle for, gosh, a couple of years now? Right. You're gonna have um, so how's the rest of this look when you try to stop more kids from getting murdered? Well, I, that's, that's an excellent question because, what, what we, so we, first of all, you set up the crime zones, and I've done that. Like I, said, I, I started with the original rectangle. I've added a, a, a crime reduction zone downtown, and now I add one in Dutchtown, Crowboy Park. 
Citywide, those, those locations are responsible for most of violent crime. And so within those zones, then with the officers, you focus on open air drug markets. There's a direct correlation between places where people are comfortable selling drugs and gun violence. I mean, I, I, I could go down the list of places that are known open air drug markets that always have a, 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 a shootings associated with it. So that being said, so you, you try to focus your attention on with that, with your patrol efforts. That's buttressed by our, our, our SWAT team, our mobile reserve, our special assignments, our, uh, uh, our various units th that are in special assignments over in that zone. Then, of course, when you lay that on top, with you get this, your, um, your task forces, everybody working in places where, where, where the, most of the violent crime is happening. So if you take down these, these drug corner dope slingers mm -hmm. um, in, in a few locations, what effect is that going to have on solving child murders? That's going to, well, solving child murders. Or, is, or solving yeah, any murder. Solving, well, solving murders, like I said, so, hey, when, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm saying gun violence, the, the strong correlation between gun violence and the drug activity, it's going to cut, if I, if I, if I, if I make a, 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 a prolific uh, 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 drug zone neutralized, I'm going to cut down on shootings. I mean that's that's a, that's a known that's a known that's that's just a known fact. If I'm able to do it now, sometimes it's very persistent. And, you, and we use surveillance. We have, we have um, we put uh, uh, high, high visibility cameras in locations, high LPR cameras. So what you try to do is focus on the violent crime. And and clearly it's in pockets across the city. But if you put your resources there, the likelihood of you offsetting potential shootings, which will result in murders, are much higher. But you do not have the ability, due to manpower, to implement this widespread right now without help from additional uh, forces that might be brought in by the task force, correct? Yeah, I, I am certainly limited by, it, it would be more effective if I had more officers. I mean, that's clearly, I mean, hey, 120 officers short, that's that's 20 officers per district that I potentially have, that I have, that, that we have a budget for, mm -hmm. that, um, that that I'm fighting on time. I, I, I really believe, uh, our recruiters would tell you that the biggest barrier to people uh, uh, joining the department would be residency. That's what our recruiters are saying. I want to get back to that in, in just a second, following up uh, on this now. So if you've got a task force and you move into these areas in force, um, the other night uh, there was an incident um, in the north side where a guy was, uh, officers approached the car, the seven-year-old in the car, right. you know, a guy had weed on his lap or something, struggled, tased, that didn't work, supposedly went for a gun, was, was shot and killed. The blowback from a lot of places, especially in some segments of the black community, is, wait a minute, you know, there may have been a seven-year-old in the car at one in the morning, but number one, we don't necessarily trust the police who say this guy was actually brandishing or going for a weapon, and number two, it was weed, why shoot and kill the guy? Uh, by way, that's by way of my asking, if you implement this program going after corner dope slingers, might this sort of thing happen and you get that kind of pushback from the community for, for doing it? Sure, so it, absolutely, it might happen and it did happen. I think the point is, is that I think people expect the police department to try to, to address violent crime. I'm, I, I promise you that there's a strong correlation between locations like that and violent crime. It's, they, they go hand in hand. The gun violence centered around open air drug markets is hand in hand. So the officer, so it's it's actually absolutely not a waste of resources to send them over there, and 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 they actually, hey, those officers in particular, hey, I would say exhibited a particular amount of courage and bravery because it was dark outside and there was a whole lot of people out there as well. But the point being is that the only way that I, that the only logical way that you can try to offset violent crime shootings, for example, is to go where those happen. And I'm saying it, it, it you can name them, you can name di different blocks, Albert. Garfield and Vanderventer, you, you, you name it, that place is going to have a lot of shooting centered around it. But that pushback shows you that no matter how bad the violent crime is and no matter what you do, there is a certain sort of base level of mistrust for whatever reason in the police department among a lot of people, especially in the African American community, where you're going to get pushback, where maybe you're not going to get the cooperation that you you needed. How does that factor into the plans if you've got a perception problem uh, on top of aggressive enforcement efforts? Is there a worry that it could essentially backfire? Well, hey, I, I think the, the first and foremost, uh, when you when you talk about location like that, they are they, not only are they eyesore, but they are they are a drain on the public, the uh, the 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 
You, you get constant complaints from citizens about locations like that. People don't feel safe around locations like that. And so I think that, that you, you, uh, in some ways, Charles, you can't have it both ways. If you really expect me to do something about violent crime, I have to be able to go into places that generate a lot of violent crime. And that's, that's your open-air drug markets. Hey, unfortunately, if, there, if somebody is, is shot or killed or whatever during that process, that, that's an unfortunate reality. But at the same time, you, I, I have to be able to go. I, I can't just say, I can't get calls from all the persons and people like that saying, hey, you got to really do something about that location. And I'm saying, well, you know, something might happen up there. Hey, so, hey, if, 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 hey all people have to do is stay out of location like that. The, the, the reason why so much high violence there is because it's self police the, 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 the buyer's going to bring a gun and the seller's going to bring a gun. And they often, don't dis they often disagree and the shootings are up. The St. Louis Police Department has one of the highest rates in the country, if not the highest. It did for a while, a couple of years ago at least, discharging weapons, you know, shooting at or shooting suspects. Is that a function of the fact that there are so many guns on the streets in St. Louis? Or do you think training could be handled differently to try to emphasize de-escalation before use of a side armor? Is that even an, an yeah, issue? Yeah, I, I think since I've been chief, I think that that number has been going down. I think that we're like, I, 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 if I'm quoting this number right, I think we have eight, eight police shootings this year. And so, hey, um, at, at the end of the day, I think what, what the, the training is, is that if you, if, if you are uh, to prevent yourself or others from being a threat of death or physical, physical harm, you, you, you are allowed to use deadly force. And so that's what, that's, what, that's what everybody's trained to do. I think that certainly I've, I've placed um, a high accountability on that. I've put, I put a very experienced person leading our force in investigative unit. And so, hey, I'm, I, I'm, I'm comfortable that as, as time progresses that, that, that we really are sending the message that we're only using um, deadly force as a last resort. So you don't think there's an overuse of it? I do not believe so. Certainly, certainly not now. In terms of the number of cops, it was revelatory. You, you, I mean, you guys in the profession knew it, but it was revelatory when Mayor Lyda Cruzman was on this program and said the shortage of police officers is not a budgetary consideration because we're not getting enough people to sign up who want to be St. Louis police officers. You indicated a moment ago that you feel the primary um, block to that is they would have to live in the city of St. Louis and they don't want to. Explain that to me. Sure. So. And like I said, I'm getting my information from the recruiter side. So, I, right. so we, we, there's three recruiters. There's one uh, Fuse Fellow, the Police Foundation has hired one, and then we have two officers that actually go to the job fairs and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Point being is that it, people are saying that they don't want to uproot. Hey, I live in this region. I might have might have even gone to gone to school with city kids in North County high schools. But the point is, is that I'm not I'm I'm settled at my church area. I'm settled with my neighborhood. I'm not. I, hey, you guys need. You guys need officers. I'm not going to uproot my family, uproot our school district to move in the city. It's a grave inconvenience. So, do you think that's the primary reason you're, you're uh, 120 uh, officers short? Uh, well, according according to the recruiters, that's the that's the the biggest challenge to recruitment. The last study I read on this, and I think it was from the Northeastern University um, uh, School of Criminal Justice, was that when it comes to residency in areas they patrol, black officers by almost double the numbers, tend to live in areas they patrol rather than white officers. And that's led to, at least in this one paper, an extrapolation of when you lift residency requirements, what you are de facto doing is opening the door to recruit more white, possibly rural officers who live outside the city. And in many cases, that might exacerbate the problem of mistrust between city residents and cops because these guys don't know the city. How, how do you respond to a criticism? Hey, like I, I, I would say that that's, that's speculative. I don't know if that would work here. Hey, we got a, we, hey, our, our city, uh, the outskirts of our city has a lot of African-American officers uh, working in other municipalities. Mm -hmm. I'm told that, that, that there's a bunch of African-American officers interested in, in working for the city of St. Louis but they cannot, you know, that, that is impractical with respect to what their family desires are to stay in, in, in school districts and other, other um, home-based things that they're interested in. So I guess, I mean, the quality of life in the city isn't, isn't high enough, whether it's the schools or something else, uh, besides just uprooting them if they've lived in one place for a long but time. That's what I think is more, inco just, I think it's inconvenience. I mean, I mean it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heavy ass to say moving the city. By the way, we're the only department that has a re that residency rule in this region. So if that residency rule is lifted, 
by the Board of Aldermen and the Mayor. Do you think that's going to go a long way, to, if not completely, to mostly solving the officer shortage problem? I believe so. Do you I have enough people who say, yeah, I'd love to be a St. Louis City cop, but I'm not living in the city to make up that, that shortfall? We even, have, we even have people that leave and come back because they like working in the city. So I, I believe that that would be the answer. Of course, we, only, only time will tell if that, if that happens. But I believe that, like I said, according to the recruiters, they're saying that the biggest things that comes up in those conversations is the inconvenience of uprooting and moving into the city. What is the status of the investigation into the officers, the white officers who made those uh, Facebook posts uh, that, that were violent and racist? I, I, the last I heard, it was ongoing that a certain number, of the police officers union claims it's five or six, were relegated to desk duty. I mean, if they're right about that number, then the rest of them are still on active duty. Is this going anywhere, and I ask this because in Philadelphia they've already fired, what is it, 13 officers, I mean, completely separated from the force over the posts they made. The investigation here is still ongoing. We haven't heard anything about the progress of that. Can you update Right, so the, the, it's in its final stages, and so there will be some updates uh, short, you know, coming shortly. And we had received some information that some of these officers are still posting this kind of stuff on, on Twitter and, and, and Facebook. I mean, the idea that that even might happen that's got to be troubling to you as, as a chief who is in charge of patrolling and controlling crime, uh, crime in a city that's half black. Sure. So if, if, if uh, uh, inappropriate posts continue, then, then uh, certainly new, new investigations will start. Do you find that the problem of active racism toward black officers um, in the department is as serious as people like Sergeant Heather Taylor and the, and the Ethical Society of Police um, say it is because obviously when you've got somebody, somebody who's a lightning rod like Jeff Rorda being a spokesman sure. for the police union, it's almost like he's declaring, you know, a jihad on anybody who criticizes the union or any officers. It increases the temperature. But you've got a, a lot of people who are, you know, former black officers or current black officers who say that active racism, if not white nationalism, is a big problem among the ranks of a lot of white officers, especially ones active in the St. Louis Police Officers Association. Do you think too much is being made of that? Do you think it's a problem? And if it is a problem, what can be done about it? Well, how about this? I don't think we have a, an increase in active racist activity uh, uh, reported in our internal affairs division. And certainly, if it were reported, we would investigate it to the fullest extent that we could. And so, again, I, I, I certainly agree that those, a lot of those posts were very insensitive. Certainly, it showed uh, racist tendencies. It showed uh, homophobic tendencies, all types of tendencies. But the point being is that it was brought to our attention. The investigation is near its conclusion. And certainly, any new uh, uh, surfacing of, of, of things that are inappropriate will be dealt with accordingly. Now, you having, uh, you know, studying law at St. Louis University and having a degree in mathematics from WashU, for heaven's sake, uh, obviously are a man who studies things and, and thinks about things. And I've got a larger question I wanted to ask okay. you. The violent crime rate in St. Louis over decades, over decades, has been on average higher than that of the rest of the country. I mean, this goes back to the, That's correct. To the 70s. This has been going on for maybe a, a half century. Uh, you've been a cop here for, what, 34 years? 32 and a half. 32 and a half yeah. years. What is going on? I mean, w every time there is a spike in crime, it seems to everyone that, oh my God, this is brand new, this hasn't happened before. But if you go back through the archives, St. Louis has led the country in violent crime rates uh, for decades. What is there specifically going on here? Is the poverty that much worse? Is the uh, racist isolation that much worse? Is the prevailing, you know, ethos in the neighborhoods that's right. much worse? The availability of guns that's much worse? I mean, over a 40 to 50 year period, what's going on? What do you think? I would say that in my, in my humble opinion, the, the poverty has been the, the biggest piece that's been consistent. So a lot of things have changed, but hey, what you, you, have, you have strong pockets of poverty uh, in St. Louis. When I, and when I say that the, um, the gun violence is associated with drug activity, the people are doing the drug activity to supplement their income. And so that there's a logical they're, income choice for them if they can't get regular I, work. I believe if, 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 if you if you've uh, uh, some of the traditional way, you know, you, you, you drop out of school or what have you, your choices are going to start to be limited. 
and hey, a quick way to make some money is, is, is to get out there and hustle some drugs. It's just a, a very dangerous occupation, and it results in a lot of high violent crime. So the problem with poverty, racism, lack of education is a long-standing one, but worse here than in other parts of the United States? Because it would certainly seem so if you just look at the violent crime rate. I would say that, the, that, that, the, that if you look at St. Louis, Baltimore, Chicago, places, places that, are, that, that have the high violent crime, also have a, a, a very poverty-stricken urban core. All right, this gets us back to where we began the discussion, sure. which is on the task force. You guys meeting with the governor and the mayor uh, were looking at enforcement solutions, boots on the ground solutions. Sure. Yet, as we've just discussed, the root causes of this run very, right. very deep. How effective can these boots on the ground campaigns be if the underlying causes, poverty, disinvestment, systemic racism, availability of guns, are still there after the enforcement sweep stops? In other words, aren't we going to requeue the video and run this movie again in three to four years? Right. I, 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 that's a point well taken. I think what, what, what you have to realize is that Hey, some of those things will take years. I mean, you're, like, like you mentioned, they've been going on for years, and certainly they'll take years to correct. But I think in the meantime, people want to want to feel safe, and they want they expect the police to 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 get you know focus on the most violent criminals in the in the area. So I'm saying, so I agree with you. Uh, the what those those things aren't those needs aren't being met. But I mean, I, I certainly believe that people want me to lock up as many violent criminals as I can, and I think they expect that from their police. What do you think the relationship is right now between the police department and the circuit attorney's office? Do you think it's strained? Do you think it's a good collaborative relationship? Would you like the circuit attorney to be more aggressive? Do you think too much is being made of this? Because there's been this ongoing social media war and war in the media in general between the circuit attorney's office and certainly spokesman for the police union. Um, I, I, as the top cop, what do you think? What's the relationship like? Well, I, th I would say that the function of the agencies, in other words, when we make arrests and the warrant application process, I would say that the function between the two ag agencies is pretty normal. Obviously, the rhetoric be uh, be between uh, 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 back and forth uh, is, is not constructive. I, don't, I think people, uh, the, the meetings that I've gone to in the community, people do not want to see uh, they, they, they want they want that if, if if there are differences between the police department and the circuit attorney's office, they want those not to be aired out in public. That's what that's the feedback I was I was getting. But but uh, but but as far as what I, I think, what I want to restore folks' confidence in is back is that the the normal function of the police department and the normal function at the circuit attorney's office uh, on most days is pretty normal. But but again, um, the the um, the climate I think created by a lot of back and forth social media. Uh, uh, tweets or what have you, it certainly seems that it's a lot more out of control. Okay, final question, Chief. From the Crime Summit, I mean, uh, and I'll be blunt, do you really trust rural, white, Republican gun-toting conservatives, the governor, the leaders of the legislature, who come almost from a completely different world, to work on this in good faith, in other words, on everything from enforcement to having a discussion about whether or not St. Louis should have separate gun laws, which you supported in the past, right? You think that absolutely. We, you think that having a separate set of gun laws for the city of St. Louis would make a lot of sense. I think that if St. Louis had something similar to Philadelphia, uh, their, their state they have a, they have a permitless carry state, but Philadelphia has the exception. That exception would help us. Tremendously, and, I, and, and case in point would be, hey, I think we released a video last year at Broadway and Grand. All these guys walk around with these AK-47s. Hey, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be doing that um, if if that law existed. Okay, with that in mind, then you're dealing with a bunch of people who, well-meaning or not, come from a completely different mindset, a completely different part of the world. You know, 56 of Missouri's 116 counties have fewer than one percent African Americans. You're as likely to see a black person as a unicorn in some of these counties. Do you expect them to come to the table in good faith? Do, do you think that they seriously think 
this is a problem that affects all the state, or does part of you think that this might just be political lip service on this on their part, and they're not serious? About I, it? I think it's I think it's in good faith because I think that the uh, certainly there are, there are a lot of African Americans in the Missouri in the Missouri um, um, government, and so I think that there there is I think it has to be in good faith because I think there's there's there are people expecting things to change. I mean, like I said, there's a lot of pressure there from all fronts. Hey, we we we've, we've we've seen an increase of gun violence. Little children involved. The, the whole thing is is unacceptable to everybody. So I think that that there's some good faith efforts to say, hey, uh, even though most of my constituents may not be in this in this situation, I think that I really we really have to do what we can to help. Chief, great to see you again. Thank you very much for Thank coming you. in, sir. Appreciate it. Our thanks to Police Chief John Hayden, and our thanks to you for joining us. If you like what you see, subscribe to our channels on YouTube and like and share our videos on Facebook. Thanks for watching. We hope you can join us back here again next week for another edition of The Jacob Report. See you then.